the last 21 years in my life in Los Angeles. Um, and I built, I built a 20 year career as a broadcast television editor. And I'm about to leave it all. I daydream, I just do dreams Built to fight, no camping Imagine your next chapter For a common path, it's the roadmap A special guest you can learn from More valuable than a treasure chest A lack of knowledge, catch fire Turn impossible to a playground Difficulties we do them in Like a pool table, got holes for them Inspiration, catch fire Find your passion and live for it Start bold, it gets harder Dig further Inspiration, catch fire Find your passion and live for it so we're here with Jeff Barsh. This whole Catch Fire show thing is an attempt to talk about uncommon career paths and, and folks that are really dialing in on who they serve, how they serve those people, and what they need to serve people. We're, we're really interested in talking to people that have kind of extrapolated those three things and come up with new combinations. And uh, when I started this, podcast i had this list of people in my head that's like oh man if this goes well i want to talk about those people and you were immediately one of those people that when we lived close to each other mm -hmm. you were a musician and I, I imagine still are a musician play i'm assuming you still have some exposure to music uh, mm -hmm. but that's not where you ended by no. any means and so i wondered if you could uh, talk to us a little bit about your story and and uh, maybe start with what you're doing now and, and we could kind of work backwards if that works. Yeah, well, basically, not to, not to bury the lead, um, right? As of this moment, as of this recording, um, I have spent the last 21 years of my life in Los Angeles. Uh, and I built, I built a 20 year career as a broadcast television editor and I'm about to leave it all. So, okay. well, that's a great <laughs> hook. Commercial break. <laughs> and cut to black. We'll talk, well, uh, we'll see you next time. But no, it, it's it, really where, where I am right now. I've built my, I built basically the bulk of my adult life has been me living in Los Angeles. Uh, building a career as a broadcast TV editor for NBC, ABC, Universal, Disney, Apple, a whole bunch of other folks. And <clears throat> the number one thing that has kept me here in Los Angeles for this whole time is technology. And that the idea of high-end broadcast television editing, where you might have up to 15 editors and 20 producers and executives all having to access the same big fat media server with all the hours and hours and the terabytes of media with shows running 30 cameras at once, all this stuff, y'all have to be physically hooked up to with fiber optic cables to these big fat servers. So you have to be physically present to do that. And for the longest time, you had to be that that's that was just the given. And no one said you, you people said you can't do editing remotely. You can't it, it will never happen. Along comes 2020 <laughs> and, uh, you know, nothing like a worldwide global pandemic to put the pressure on making things happen that people said would never happen. It, it just so happened that the show that I was editing earlier this year was a show for NBC that was already, they would already wrapped production and, uh, that's when so and so they were striking the set they shot in atlanta and they were bringing everything back to la and we were starting up the edit and the whole city started to shut down the entire industry the whole world was starting to shut down because COVID was just starting to really become a serious thing and nbc said um we can't shoot anything so you guys now have air dates so you better figure out how to get this remote editing thing happening now <laughs> So the next thing you know, I'm sitting in the corner of my bedroom at a card table with an iMac editing primetime and network television content that was that was on the air on NBC a month and a half later. It was insane. So all this time, my entire career, everyone has said to do high end television editing, you have to be physically present. You no longer have to do that. I've been editing remotely 
the entire year, plus some of last year on other projects. And it just got, it, it just came to the point where my wife and I realized we don't have to be here anymore. So we're leaving. Cool. That's, I mean, and you're a good storyteller too, because you, you have these great points where I'm just like, now what's next? This is great. <laughs> Oh, so. and, and the thing is, the, the next thing I'm doing, it, it may involve editing, and but it will most certainly involve something related, but not editing. So okay. there is, it's pivoting is in process, literally as we speak. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the one pivot you talked about, obviously, was technology and how that frees you up. It sounds like you guys have family in different parts of the country that you might move a little closer to family. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chantel's family is focused around a general idea of uh, northeastern part of Ohio, so we're probably going to end up there. Uh, and then I have I have some family, uh, I have some family in Omaha that we're going to be spending some time there. And I know your uh, Omaha is near and dear to your heart, and because uh, you have family there too. Oh yeah. And and so yeah, it's going to be it. It's an adventure, but the thing that's happening now is related to what I've spent my last 20 years building. But I'm going to just backtrack again, because your, your original question was about music. It, the, all of this started with me uh, being four years old, and I shared a bedroom with my two older brothers. And we were actually living in Omaha at the time. We were living uh, at this, in, this, in this house where we three brothers shared the same room. And I take that back. We were not in Omaha. We were in South Dakota at the time. But um, I had this whole list of songs that I had to sing every night before I went to bed. Drove my brothers nuts. They're like, dude, just stop. Enough with the <laughs> Jesus Loves Me and the ABCs and Mary Had a Little Lamb. It's like, enough. Uh, someone, however it happened, someone gave our family a piano and this one of these big, enormous upright pianos, and we had this thing, we got into our living room, and I went up to that thing at age four, and I started poking out melodies on it. And next thing you know, I stopped singing at night, and my brothers were doing the happy dance. And that was when I started picking out tunes on the piano by ear, and when I started figuring out certain things like, oh, I can change certain notes and make this, this happy sound, this happy melody sound all sad and spooky, I discovered the minor key instead of the major key. And that's when my mom said, okay, get this kid some lessons. And so I started taking piano lessons. I've been classically trained and I've also played piano by ear ever since I was four, still do it to this day, um, much less so in general today but uh, I studied music composition in college and um, did all kinds of performing, uh, arranging, recording, all the things in, uh, in junior high and high school. And I I'd first thought that um, after my first two years of college in Omaha, back in the day at Grace University, that I was going to move to Los Angeles and I was thinking that I could be a studio musician. Yeah. And, uh, Luckily, as it turns out, I ended up going to film school, running out of money, dropping out of college, and I got some connections from the film school that gave me my first jobs in the film and TV industry, and I ended up in TV editing. I got my first job as an intern in post-production, and I've been in editing ever since. And it, it turns out that was a really good thing because it, that was right around the time when samplers were really getting to the point where it's, it's it, it, it was becoming more and more difficult for live musicians to make a living in the studio and it's become even harder ever since so um but it all started with music and i wondered when i was great there was a time when i graduated from high school when i thought you know because i'd started getting into video production and all that kind of stuff in high school and so I'm like, okay, I have this piano stuff, I have this video stuff, and I, I learned stuff about radio and voiceover. I actually did some radio work when I was in college, and I didn't really know how it all fit together. And I thought, well, where am I gonna go? 
because, you know, to your point, I never felt like I wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer. I just had all the stuff that I liked to do. And it was kind of in like the, around the idea of, it was around the idea of media and music and, and video and moving pictures. I just didn't have a through line. What I've since discovered, the through line is communication and storytelling. That's the thing that ties it all together. That's why if I'm sitting at a piano and I'm improvising a piece, it's the same core thing uh, to me as when I'm sitting in an edit bay and I'm crafting a piece of, and I'm crafting a piece for a TV show, or I'm sitting at my laptop writing an email to my email list for one of my businesses that I'm building online. It's all about communication. And it took me a long time to figure out that through line. Yeah. Uh, it seems like some of us stumble into, you know, work two ways as we, as we grow up. One is this kind of a thing of like enjoying what we're good at, enjoying what we might be naturally talented at. And then this other thing that, you know, sometimes people do one or both or, or a mixture, but this idea of exchanging our time for money. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so then, you know, when you kind of come full circle to do enough of both of those that you can get that through line, like telling stories. I mean, that's, that's a pretty big gift. Well, and the other thing that it also took me a, a while to realize, there was a time when, there was a time when I read a book, another, well, what some people would say it's the, the most popular financial advice book ever written. It's, it's, it's called Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And it, it talks about a mindset about money and business and exchanging of value that was completely different from anything that I had ever been exposed to growing up. And that book turned my brain inside out. And at the time I was right in the get paid more than once instead of just exchanging my hours for dollars as you and that learning about and for a long time I just had absolutely no idea what I was doing and I thought okay well maybe I should not do online business with editing or stuff like that maybe I should do uh, maybe, maybe I should do some something on, on um, real estate and I found out that I had zero desire to do real estate. And so in the, in the meantime, I had this, this idea that was put in my head that, okay, this thing over here, this, the TV editing thing, that's just me trading my hours for dollars. So somehow that was less than in my mind than these projects that I was building on the side of, you know, being my own boss, being an entrepreneur. What I came to realize, I love editing. It feeds my soul. I love the creative process and I get paid really good money to do it. <laughs> what on earth is wrong with that, you know? And so I, I, it, there will be times when we're thinking, okay, what am I doing? Is it just a job? Or is it a career? Is it a calling? Is it some blend of all the above? And you know what? It's okay to love your job. Uh, it's, and, and, and the thing is, it took me a long time to realize that not everyone does love their job because I've pretty much always loved what I do. So um, that, you know, realizing that a lot of people don't love their jobs, that was a big deal for me to realize that. I'm like, oh, okay. I guess not everyone is like me. Imagine yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so so that, that was actually really humbling to realize, number one, not everyone loves what they do. And number two, it's okay for me to love what I do, even if in sometimes, it, even if it sometimes shows up with me trading my hours for dollars, that can be okay too. Yeah. So then uh, just kind of what I'm hearing is that the, 
the what, you know, the when you t we talk about uh, who you serve, how you serve, what you need to serve, that you've done that through music and, and performance, you've done that then through uh, TV editing and, and media. And it sounds like then you, you were talking about the how really for both those seem to be storytelling. Um, mm -hmm. When you talk about the who, is that as important to you, like who you're telling stories to? You know, that's a really good question. You know, yeah, I don't really know how to answer that, man, because because um, really, I think I've always mostly been driven by do I believe in what I'm in, in what I'm saying? Do I believe in the stories that I'm supporting? And it just it, it, it so happens that most of the time when I am supporting something that I believe in, um, that that project ends up connecting with the people who need to hear what that project is 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 offering, what that story is saying. It it connects to the audience who needs to be there. So uh, in that sense, I. Sometimes it's sometimes the, the audience is completely outside my control. For instance, if I'm editing, if I'm editing a, a show on NBC, um, it <laughs> NBC does their thing, you know, and however many million people show up and watch it either off the air or either watch it off the air or down the road on, 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 on replay in some format. Um, that's completely outside of my control, but I I am very uh, I, I am very fortunate, and I have put a lot of attention into telling stories and being on projects that I believe in that spread the values yeah. and the ideas that I want that that I want to see myself supporting. Yeah, and I think that's freeing for people to hear uh, personally. You know that like if there's. I'm not saying these three aspects are like the the golden formula, the who, the, the who, the how, the what, but but just that you're a little bit more open-handed with the the who. It sounds like, and you know, other people might have other things. Um, I I am wondering though, like some of your side businesses. I I don't know all of them. I know one of them may have been that you wrote a book. I I feel like mm -hmm. you wrote a book about editing, and it, it seems like that might have been more focused on serving uh, aspiring editors potentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when it, it, it kind of goes back to that 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 moment that I that I was mentioning when when I read the book about entrepreneurialism and how it turned my head inside out, and so I said, oh, okay, well, I'm going to escape from this trading my hours for dollars. I'm going to build online businesses. My first online business that I attempted to build had very little. Uh, it, it, I had absolutely no idea what a business needed to be on or, or how to make it run and how to actually make it make money. And it just puttered along and did basically nothing. Um, I've, 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 I've set up multiple businesses since then. And um, the about, uh, let's see, at this point, like six or seven years ago, I started something called the Power Edit. And it, it was based around teaching creative editing skills to um, both to young editors and assistant editors who wanted to be a full-time broadcast TV editor. And so that offered coaching and in classes and stuff like that. And then it also, it also talked to um, aspiring uh, to amateurs and intermediate level hobbyists outside places like New York and Los Angeles and uh, talked about creative editing skills with them. And so that's when I wrote my book. It's, uh, it's called uh, Edit Better Hollywood Tests and Strategies for Powerful Video Editing. So that's one of the things that I worked on. And then um, I actually decided to step away from that. Um, and the current version of that business is actually called Story Greenlight. And it is an online community that helps YouTube creators create their best content on YouTube. So you can see you, you, you can see that there's a through line, but the who 
but the who is uh, it, it shifts and it adjusts as you go. And I will say it goes a step further than that because thanks to the craziness of 2020, I actually uh, was talking with a friend of mine, uh, uh, talking with a friend of mine who is one of the top YouTube consultants in the world. And it turns out that his producer who had been overseeing producing aspects for his YouTube channel was moving on from their team. And, and he says, Jeff, I think you should start up an agency that offers YouTube producing services for large YouTube creators. No one, it, like, I know so many people who need that and there is no one who's actually doing this, hardly anyone who's doing it. He says, I think you should start up an agency. And the first time he told me that, I thought, you know, this is, nah, it's not my thing. Yeah, you know. Uh, but a little while later, when when his producer was actually in the place where where the producer was moving on, it's like, this is a need. Uh, you know what? I think you're right. I should start an agency. So this year, right in the middle of COVID quarantine, I started up a new division of my company. Uh, an agency that helps provide project management and creative services and talent placement for large established YouTube creators, 100,000, 500,000 million subscribers, so that, that kind of a thing. So the pivoting keeps happening. The pivoting keeps happening. But as, you know, as we've already kind of referenced, it all goes back to what uh, it all goes back to storytelling and communication. I tell people that my mission is to tell stories and to empower people to tell theirs. So when I finally figured it out to that, there is a whole world of stuff that you can hang your hat on when you have something like that. What is your mission? What are you about? What do you want to see happen? You can have a job that supports that. You can have a nonprofit that supports that. You can have online businesses. You can, you can do all kinds of things that's based around that one idea. So that's, that's one of the things that drives me um, as I continue to pivot right now. That's really cool. And I, uh, I, this is a little bit out of the scope of what we normally talk about on the podcast, but um, just re going back to the book that we talked about at the top, the mm -hmm. uh, capitalist without any capital. I mean, you're choosing some good pickaxes to complete the metaphor. I mean, so the YouTube folks, I mean, they're the ones that are the gold miners, right? They're, they're the ones that are taking the risk and having the channels and trying to get the audience. You're just giving them all the things that they need to be successful. You get paid for sure. Mm -hmm. They are taking the risk. That's pretty brilliant from a business well, strategy. And, and I will say, if Nathan Latka ever hears this, thanks dude, because that's what well, that was one of those ideas. You know, that, that the idea of selling pickaxes, just selling pickaxes, bleh, selling yeah. pickaxes to the gold miners, uh, that's that was really instrumental in helping my mind click into this idea when my friend said, dude, you should start an agency. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a that's a really smart connection. Cool. Uh, so I think that, um, and I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way before, but uh, I, I'm a big uh, Simon Sinek fan, the start mm -hmm. with why, find your why. Um, mm -hmm. But I felt myself struggling when people continue to challenge me about what my why is. Because, and I don't know if you can relate to this, but it's like, um, you know, you, we'll use your stuff as an example, and, and you can tease us out. How you, like, you are saying that you're... Um, driven by telling stories or you you've you've coalesced that the sto telling stories piece is a through line in your work but that might not be mm -hmm. if somebody asks you why are you on this earth <laughs> that mm -hmm. you know they those two things yes. might not be the same and so i think you know for for folks that are creative for folks that have come from an art background you know that that um kind of self-actualizing is really important and all this kind of stuff i mean there's a lot of noise here so do you, do you have any thoughts about kind of cutting through that all and talking to people about um, how you kind of yeah cut through that noise and 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 stay focused but also um, keep yourself and keep your identity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the 
I mean, that, that's a very that's a very important distinction that you're drawing there about the idea of the motivation versus what are we here on this earth to do. Um, one of the things we talk about a lot at Story Greenlight, and when I'm talking with with my students or with my clients, is a concept called the thing under the thing, and. Uh, Usually, I'm applying it within the context of YouTube videos, and we talk about how, you know, people talk about things that are on the surface. And, you know, if you have, if you have a YouTube channel that's about, say, that's about fashion, um, then, you know, you're talking about clothes. That's the thing. But if you're if what you're really wanting to get at if what if, if what people are connecting with underneath that surface you know there, there's always something there there's always something deeper than what goes under the surface and people who build those great connections they connect with things that are under the surface they connect to those ideas that are connected to the surface level things that i refer to as the thing under the thing so for instance with this youtube channel that's about fashion it it's about clothes that's the, on the surface that's the thing but the thing under the thing it's about who you see yourself as a person it's about your identity it's about unlocking confidence it's about being the best version of yourself so that's something I'm always asking people is let's take to, if you want to make more impact with your content, if you want to make more impact, frankly, with your life and with your relationships, I mean, you can go as broad on this as you want, take what's on the surface and create connections to those more important elements, those things under the thing. So taking that back to your question about motivation and even going as wide as why am I on the face of the earth? Um, part of that is if you're, if you're, if one is wanting to be true to oneself, one of the things that one should ask oneself is, what am I good at? What do I love? Uh, I was, I was working with a with an executive coach a number of years back. And he and some of the prep work that he had in, in preparation for this all day one on one coaching event that I did with him was he literally had me write out a an autobiography of my life in bullet points. I got up to the point where I was 18 and I ran out of time and I'm just like, OK, I should stop there. And um, and it turns out he pointed out to me that the things that we love as kids point to elements that are deeply are, are, are deeply uh, connected to us as human beings and they hardly ever change so one of the things i realized was i'm the kid who spent hours and hours and hours in the basement playing with legos as a kid i was playing with all these tiny little pieces and connecting them all these different ways and making these new cool things. That is exactly what I do as a television editor. I'm, you know, I'm not playing with Lego blocks. I'm taking picture and sound and music and ideas and I'm putting them together to create this new thing. It's no wonder I love editing so much. It's no wonder I love the process of building stuff like this so much because I've been doing it my whole life. And so, um, when you're looking at when you're looking at your motivation and seeing and asking yourself what do I love, often it's those things that that have been in place ever since we were kids that can provide some clues to what you love and how you can build things around those ideas. But if you stop at only who you are, um, I believe you're selling yourself way short because uh, we are here not just in ourselves, we're here in community. One of the things you just did for us is you, you built a lot of value into the vocation of creating and all those different things. Um, I wondered if you could kind of take the other perspective for a minute, uh, sure. folks that put kind of the ultimate value into their uh, work, into their art, 
and it's it's so much that like there's no price tag that's enough. Like I talked to somebody uh, a few years ago that they were having trouble uh, selling their photos, and I was like, "What are you taking photos of?" Well, people are having me take photos of their pets, and I was like, "Well, why are you having trouble selling those photos?" Well, I um, I sign every photo on the front with a silver sharpie because it's mm-hmm. my art. And I'm like, so they're paying you for the session? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, and they want to pay you for the photos? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, so why can't you just, you know, give them the photo? And he's like, well, this is my art, so I have to sign it with a silver Sharpie. And uh, and it was like no amount of money, it didn't seem like, was going to get him to sell those prints without his signature as a silver Sharpie. And so I just want, you know, a lot of what you do is heavily commercialized um, you're doing things you believe in, but I mean, there's advertising, there, there's millions of viewers, all of that's driven by commerce. Um, can you talk about kind of how you think about your art in terms of uh, having a fair value for it that that is uh, also, you know, gets it out there and, and distributes it? Yeah, that's that's a really, that's a really good question. The, you know, if you want to put a very bold point on it. Television content and film content does not exist sheerly for the sake of the content. It exists to sell things. A movie does not exist sheerly because the movie is amazing and it should exist in and of itself, end of story. It exists because there is someone somewhere who believes that I can put money behind this movie and enough people will buy either tickets to show up physically in a movie theater or rental online that it will make me money. And that is why this movie is happening because someone believes that it can make them money. Same thing with broadcast television. Um, Even though standard broadcast television is frankly a dying model, you know what? Let's not even talk about let's not even talk about standard broadcast. Let's just let's talk about Netflix. Netflix is the 800 pound gorilla in the online content on demand world. They have more money than God. <laughs> and it and it's it's one of these things where and they spend more money than God on their production budgets for all these shows and they put out 500 new shows a season it's insane why does netflix do that because they think they can make money at it because their investors who put billions of dollars at this point into netflix believe that they will get billions plus back for their for themselves and their stakeholders so uh lest it seem that I'm getting cynical at this point. Um, I don't see that as being cynical. It's merely the reality of what is happening in the world. It's why things happen. What the, 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 the gift in this as creatives is that it doesn't have to be all one or all the other. I mean, Netflix has, an, has legions of people working in this at its company who know that the reason people will come and pay that $15, $20 a month or whatever the Netflix subscription is, and you will get however many millions of people paying that is because of the content. The content then becomes the vehicle. So yes, the vehicle is driven by the money, but the, but, but the business doesn't work without the content. And so both are important, both are valuable. And so those who wish to say, I want to create great content, I have a message that I want to spread through this content. If you can hook up with that within that ecosystem, that's a platform that you can have to spread your message, to tell your stories. On a much more personal level, go to YouTube. Literally anyone who has a cell phone with a camera can now create content, hit upload on the YouTube app, and ta-da, you now have spread your content to the world. Literally anyone can do that. So it's not, but, you know, even with YouTube, why does YouTube exist? 
YouTube exists to make money for its investors and for its company. It makes money by ads. Those pop-up ads and the mid-roll ads that roll uh, before and after and sometimes annoyingly in the middle of YouTube videos. And YouTube is so gracious and so generous. They give you the opportunity to say, we will show you no ads whatsoever for a small monthly subscription. So, so again, it's, th there is always going to be a tension between commercialism and creativity when it comes to art that is sustainable. That is not a mutually exclusive thing. It's a tension that you have to adjust personally. Thank you. I think that tension is really important because I think that um, none of us have it figured out perfectly. But I think one of the things that I hear through your stories and your your examples too is that you've not only captured that tension for your your primary mode, whether it's editing or 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 storytelling, but also it seems like you're able to bring some creativity to your business, even how your businesses are set up too, because you're willing to embrace that tension. And and so it just it seems it appears that what I'm hearing is just that you have more and more freedom to create the more you can kind of live in this tension. Oh yeah. And the, you know, and that's, that is the thing about, that's the thing about growth. You know, I, I've been thinking a lot and, and talking with my clients and my students a lot about when you push yourself, whether, whether you're lifting, whether you're physically lifting weights, I mean, muscles only grow. They only actually grow when they're being pushed, when they're being pushed. So if you're lifting weights and you're not working hard, you're not growing. If you are wanting to grow in your creativity and your communication and you're not right there on the edge of this is, this is a little scary, this might work, but this might not work too, that's the edge where you want to be. That's where you're growing. And that's when you that's when the growth and the breakthroughs and the excitement comes because it's when, when everything is all in place and everything is working and you know exactly what to expect, that's when you get bored. And that's when things start falling apart and you're wondering, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? But man, you, you, you get on that edge, you push yourself. That's where the exciting stuff happens and you will not know the answers. That is the very, that's the whole point. You cannot know the answers, but that's what makes it so exciting. I feel like we should wrap it there. Like that's where I'm going to cut it. Unless you have anything else you want to leave it with people. I mean, that was a great, this has been great. So do you, is there anything else you want to leave people with? You know what I will say for those who are wanting to find their path, wondering if they should pivot. The answer is when you are looking for that answer, if it's an answer that is genuinely worth seeking, it will not be an easy answer that will be obvious right away. Therefore, the only response to that is to move forward, is to take action and to adjust as you go. You cannot know all the answers. You step out um, yeah, some people would say you step out in faith. You have an idea what, of what you might want to see happen. You don't know how it's going to work. And you know that you can adjust as you go. But the first step is you have to decide to move forward. And that's where it all starts.